Welcome to part two of the question, nearly guaranteed to get me in trouble. Can women pastor and preach? I'm Nate, one of the elders of Think Kingdom Church in Kannapolis, North Carolina, and this is Think Kingdom's FAQ. If you haven't seen part one of this question, it would probably be helpful to go and watch that first, where we set the table with some general principles and talked about the differences between the egalitarian and complementarian approach to this subject. And as promised, we're going to be starting with 1 Timothy and using that as a launching point to see what the Bible teaches about the role of women in the church. Women should learn quietly and submissively. I do not let women teach men or have authority over them. Let them listen quietly, for God made Adam first and afterward he made Eve. So, in broad terms, there have been three approaches to this passage. First, the universal approach, meaning that this is, in fact, a principle that applies to all cultures at all times. It's universal. If asked, what about Galatians 3.28, they would argue that that represents an ideal. It's how things will be in the new heavens and new earth, but we're not yet in that age. Jesus told us that when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. And while we don't actually know what the angels are like with regards to gender roles, this would seem to indicate that those relationships won't be the same as they are for us here and now. The complementarian would argue that God is best served when women fulfill the role for which God created them, and that that's consistent with Paul's other New Testament writings. They would point out that we must not allow our culture to trump what the Bible teaches. Next, we have the polemical approach. A polemic is just an argument, a strong verbal or written attack on someone or something. 1 Timothy is often presented as sort of a handbook on the qualifications of leadership roles in the New Testament church, but Paul was also clearly addressing issues created by false teaching as well. So the proponents of this view argue that addressing false teachers is in fact the primary lens through which we should be interpreting 1 Timothy. They would say that Paul was addressing a particular situation created by these false teachers. And they would suggest that this interpretation fits the broader context of 1 Timothy, particularly uh, chapter 2, verses 8 through 15, where Paul aims to correct inappropriate behavior on the part of both men and women. Our third view would be the cultural interpretation, and this is sometimes paired with the polemical view. Advocates of this believe that while Christians should respect cultural norms, if at all possible, that doesn't mean that those cultural norms are necessarily good or that they're intended for every culture. They would argue that the women in Ephesus probably didn't have the training necessary to qualify as teachers, but that doesn't apply to women universally. They would also point out that both Paul and the early church in general had a tendency towards the full engagement of women in ministry. In the New Testament, we find women praying and prophesying. We find them teaching, and we find them going to prison right alongside Paul. And some scholars believe that Junia, a woman referred to in Romans 16, 7, was actually an apostle. So, some things to consider. Inconsistent application of biblical passages can be a real issue. We often have a tendency to keep only the parts we like and ignore those we don't. Uh, next, we often have unbiblical definitions of church office. We have people called pastors that are actually deacons. We have deacons that are actually pastors and so on. Uh, often, we create extra rules and requirements beyond those found in scripture. A third, leadership in the church isn't the same as leadership in the home. People can be followers and leaders in different arenas of their life. Uh, further, translation. It's hard work. Going from one language to another requires us to inject interpretation at some points. So when we go from Greek to English, sometimes subtlety can be lost and a nuanced phrase becomes a verbal sledgehammer. 
This isn't necessarily bad. It, it's just the nature of translating. Many of the passages quoted for or against women in church leadership don't actually support either side. You almost have to bring your position to the text first. In other words, what you believe will determine how you translate that. But the text itself doesn't necessarily support you. Uh, for example, in 1 Timothy 3, some translations refer to deacons' wives and some refer to women. The word is gune. It can mean wife or it can mean woman. If you believe deacons should be men, then wives is the best translation. If you don't, you might argue that woman is the best choice. Or in Judges 4, we have Deborah ruling Israel as a judge. Some would say this is a precedent for women in leadership, but others would point out that in 300 years, she was the only female judge and God was also clearly chastising men for their lack of leadership. So it wasn't necessarily a precedent. It was an exception. Okay, so at this point, you might be more confused than when we started. And I get that. There's a reason that this is such a controversial topic. We've got a wide variety of conclusions running the gamut from mistranslation to misinterpretation to misogyny and straightforward God-ordained patriarchy. And because you can make an argument for more than one side that isn't a totally crazy reach, I suggested last week that this shouldn't be an issue that's closed hand. Let's look briefly at our options. You could hold that God intends for men to be the leaders of the church and that no leadership roles are available for women. Honestly, I think that this is a hard position to justify from Scripture. There is ample evidence for women deacons in Scripture and women in Scripture participated in proclaiming the gospel, which is preaching, and taught in at least some contexts. There are some who would argue that women can't be the leaders of the church. They would be eligible for any role in the church except for that of the pastor or elder or whatever label you put on that. There is a case to be made for this position. And when I started working on this FAQ three months ago, this is where I would have staked my flag. But as I said last week, I've come to the conclusion that I was wrong and I now believe that women can be pastors. And very briefly, very briefly, here's why. Most of the passages about female submission are actually part of a larger discussion on mutual submission between husbands and wives. You know, we don't seem to object to women braiding their hair despite what Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 2.9, and we, at least in the West, don't greet each other with a holy kiss even though Paul tells his readers repeatedly to do so. The church at large has concluded that these were clearly intended for different cultures in a different context, and we recognize that. I can't see why we don't apply the same cultural sensitivity to all of 1 Timothy 2. In addition, each letter where Paul seems to promote male-dominated leadership, he also urges slaves to be subject to their masters. But we know that Paul didn't condone slavery. In 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 11, Paul lists several types of sinners he considers to be lawless, rebellious, and ungodly, including slave traders. If Paul didn't consider slavery itself to be sinful, he wouldn't have put slave traders in this list. So why, you might ask, did Paul urge slaves to be subject to their masters? Well, he explained his logic to the Corinthians that each of you should remain as you were when you were called. Are you a slave? Don't let that worry you. But if you get a chance to be free, take it. And remember, if you were a slave when the Lord called you, you are now free in the Lord. And if you were free when the Lord called you, you are now a slave to Christ. God paid a high price for you, so don't be enslaved by the world. Each of you, dear brothers and sisters, should remain as you were when God first called you. He told Titus that slaves must always obey their masters and do their best to please them. They must not talk back or steal, but must show themselves to be entirely trustworthy and good. Then 
they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive in every way. So Paul's focus was on proclaiming the gospel, not in redeeming man-made systems or fomenting political rebellions. Paul knew that if masters and slaves were added to the church, that they would eventually be confronted with the reality that there is no longer slave or free in the body, and slavery wouldn't be able to persist where the church grew strong. That same passage also tells us that there is no male or female, yet we don't seem to read Paul's comments about women through the same lens as his comments about slaves. Why is that? In the larger context of scripture, we've already seen that women served in many roles in the early church. The prophet Joel said that in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. And we know that this was fulfilled with the birth of the church. I've come to the conclusion that that's why Paul said there is no male or female in the church, because just like ethnicity, Jews and Gentile, gender doesn't matter when it comes to the priesthood of all believers. How do we have a royal priesthood of all believers if half the church is limited by their gender? All right, so I know that many of you don't agree with me. Some of you probably think that I've gone off the deep end, and I'm okay with that. If you want to debate me in the Facebook comments, I'm not going to do that. It's not going to be productive. But if you want to come and have a conversation with me at Think Kingdom some Sunday, I'm all for it. If you want to email me, I'll do that. I'm not hard to find. I look forward to hearing from you. And until next time, thanks for watching.